Do you ever feel overwhelmed by a great host of the enemy? Fret not thyself because of evildoers. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. The Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Never feel overwhelmed by a great host of the enemy. A natural reaction is to exclaim, Alas, my master, how shall we do? A spiritual response is to exhort, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Sometimes the natural man and the spiritual man can alternate control of our thoughts between those two seemingly with each step we take through a, a trial. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. And prayerfully, this message will help anchor our approach to spiritual warfare to make us strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In the southern kingdom of Judah, there was a king, Jehoram, who ruled from about 850 to 843 B.C. He was preceded by his father, Jehoshaphat. And there was, I believe, an overlapping period of co-reigning, which can make some of the chronologies of, of the Bible a little challenging. He was succeeded by his son, Ahaziah. In the northern kingdom of Israel, there was a king, Jehoram. And no, I didn't cut and paste wrong. It's the same name. Some places in scripture, it's contracted to King Joram. But we have a southern King Jehoram and a northern King Jehoram. The northern king ruled from about 854 to 843 BC. You say they had the same name. Was there any relationship between the two? Yes, they were uh, brother brothers-in-law or brother-in-laws however you say that and don't make me map it out on a napkin napkin for you <laughs> I just know they were brothers-in-law uh, the northern king Jehoram was the son of Ahab and Jezebel great bloodlines <laughs> he was preceded on the throne by his brother Ahaziah you say, no, but again didn't you just say Ahaziah he was the son of of this southern king Jehoram. Well, here he was also a brother of the northern king Jehoram. And he ruled for a very brief period of time. And then King Jehoram ruled again from 854 to 843. He was succeeded by King Jehu. Uh, this northern king Jehoram, a good king or bad king? Easy question. <laughs> you said northern, we say bad. Northern, bad. Northern, bad. Now, Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria. And Samaria is a name sometimes used for the northern kingdom. Sometimes it's used just for uh, the capital of the northern kingdom. So sometimes used interchangeably. I'm reading from the beginning of 2 Kings chapter 3. You can start to work your way to 2 Kings Chapter 3, now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. Chapter 3 of 2 Kings, uh, second verse now, and he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother. You know, again, that tells you just how wicked God viewed 
Ahab and, and Jezebel. So he was evil, but not like his father and, and like his mother. For he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. So on, on the one hand, we say, well, bad is bad, sin is sin, evil is evil. But even with all the evil kings, God kind of racks and stacks them a, a little bit. He was evil, not as evil as his parents, but he was still evil. He followed in the sins of uh, the first uh, northern king of the divided kingdom that everyone seems to be, by the Holy Spirit, referred back to uh, Jehoram, or Jeroboam. Excuse me. Now, during Jehoram's reign, so we're focusing now on this northern king, Jehoram. During his reign, he first had to deal with a Moabite uh, uprising. That's in uh, chapter 3 here of, of 2 Kings. And he joined forces with the southern kingdom, at that time initially Jehoshaphat. And he was rebuked by Elisha and rebuked for his wicked, wicked parents. You know, hey, go to the false gods of, of your parents. If, you know, why are you, why are you coming to me? And so he was rebuked by Elisha. Who's Elisha? And I look out, and on the one hand, I say, well, you're a bunch of Bible smart people. You know Elisha. And first there was Elijah, then there was Elisha, and you know the story. But I think, you know, if you're sitting in a congregation and the preacher says, you all know this, and you don't know that, how does that make you feel? <laughs> so, so I'm going to read and, and uh, maybe remind some of you, maybe tell some others. For the first time, who this Elisha was in chapter 2 of 2 Kings, verse 9 through 13. Chapter 2, verse, uh, beginning of verse 9, honing in on who Elisha is. It came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou has to ask a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah. We'll, we'll stop there with that, just that thought. Who was Elisha? Well, he took up the mantle of the prophet Elijah. Elisha prophesied that God would bring victory to this northern king, Jehoram, over the Moabites. So he first he chastened him, again, for his parents. And then Elisha said, but God's going to give you the victory. Well, next in his kingship, he had to deal with an attack by the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, or Ben-Hadad, however your Bible tells you to pronounce it. And so for our, our text tonight, I'd like you to turn to chapter 6. And I'm going to pick up in verse 8 and read down from the, from the Word of God to verse 23. So 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, verse 8 down to verse 23. This is what the Word of God uh, perfectly preserved for us reads. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel. And took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He's basically saying, all right, who's the leaker? Who's the spy? You know, we, uh, we get together, we counsel, we come up with a game plan. 
And the one we're trying to attack already knows what's, what's going to happen. He knows our plans. And you can imagine what they were saying. <laughs> you know, he, he's looking at his, his close advisors and which one to use the leaker? Who's going to say me? <laughs> and then off with the head. And so they point to Elisha, <laughs> which is true. God gave the, the prophet of God his mouthpiece and this wisdom. One of his servants said, none, my Lord, O king, but Elisha. The prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was, yeah, send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. It, it has to put a, somewhat of a smile on your face to read what's, uh, understand what's, what's going on here. And it came to pass, when they were come into Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord... Open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And I don't know if that's how he said it, but you can imagine in your mind how excited the king of Israel must have been. He was being attacked, and all of a sudden the enemy's right there in front of him. The man of God, Elisha, just... Leads them in. Uh, kind of an in interesting scene here. But this was the prophet's response. And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink, and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Until you read a little further, and they, they wind up coming back a little later. But it, it, it ends uh, this particular uh, battle scene, or potential uh, battle scene. Uh, biblical truths. Uh, that we can see from, from wearing our spiritual spectacles. Biblical truths in spiritual warfare take us from, alas, my master, to fear not. If we don't see battles for what they are spiritually, we'll fret. Uh, relating... Uh, for uh, better or worse, to the key figures in our, in our text, we're going to follow this as, as an outline. We're going to look at the minister to the man of God. We're going to look at the prophet Elisha, and then we're going to look at uh, this northern king, uh, Jehoram. And whether we would do well or not well to follow some of their patterns of behavior here. And so we're going to look at mimicking the minister uh, look at number two, playing the prophet, and number three, copying the king. And if you're taking notes, you can 
Uh, write king with a C or copying with a K if it makes you feel better. Uh, if, if not, it just sounds appropriate. So mimicking the minister, playing the prophet, and copying the, the king. So I pray we'd be able to uh, allow this historical account that's recorded for us to be used of God to teach each and every one of us at least one biblical truth about spiritual warfare. I believe there's a lot, a lot of lessons to learn here, but I, I pray that each and every one of you would be able to take home just something from the message tonight, one truth about spiritual warfare. First off, do we want to mimic this minister, the servant of the man of God, honing in on, on verse 15? When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and host compassed the city both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? So this is the servant of the man of God who was the servant of the man of God. So the, the servant or minister to Elisha, who we read before, was servant to Elijah. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? I'm reading back from in, in chapter 3. And one of the uh, king of Israel's servants answered, this is when they had they were joining forces together, uh, against the Moabites in, in that case. Uh, one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphath, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And we sometimes refer to that to, to think of the type of ministry he was. He, oh, you're going to wash your hands? Here, let, let me pour water on, on your hands. Might be somewhat akin in our minds to uh, Joshua being a minister to Moses. Uh, it's referenced in the beginning of Joshua, Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, and, and back in Exodus 24, and verse 13. In the New Testament, we might think of John Mark as a minister to Barnabas and, and Saul at the beginning of Acts chapter 13. Later on, when there was a bit of a disagreement between Barnabas and, and Paul, John Mark became minister primarily to Uncle Barnabas, Acts 15.39. But then later on became profitable to, to Paul. And Paul references uh, Barnabas and uh, or John Mark, excuse me, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11. Uh, so uh, lest we think that it's a bad thing to mimic someone that's ministering to the, the man of God, uh, there were good aspects of that, many of which we, we don't have recorded in Scripture. Maybe a little hinting at his service to the, the prophet. Uh, he had risen early, and in my mind, I was just thinking, well, yeah, let the prophet sleep a little bit, and you're the minister, uh, you're serving him, so you get up earlier, you, you get out there and maybe get the fire going and prepare breakfast or get ready to break camp, or that's just kind of my mind thinking, he probably was a good servant of, of Elisha. Uh, perhaps he had seen some of Elisha's uh, miracles that the Lord wrought through him and, and considered it a a privilege to, to serve him. So not saying he's all bad. He got up early. And yet his response in this case of seeing the enemy is what we do not want to mimic. He was fearful and he was faithless. How do we know he was fearful? Well, because Elisha told him to fear not. And he was crying out basically, ah, what are we going to do? He was full of fear, and sometimes we use the acrostic for fear. You've, it's not the first time likely you've heard it. F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. And so I thought about that, and in some ways that would, would fit the scenario here for his fear. Uh, but I thought also fear can be not false evidence, but real evidence, but it's just interpreted falsely. And he saw some real things, some real evidence, but his perception of them is what was false and is what brought the fear. Alas, my master, how shall we do? There were real enemy forces out there from the king of, of Syria. They were real. He saw them. They were roundabout. His false perception of those enemy forces was, we will be defeated 
and die. That didn't happen. It was a false perception. Master, master, we perish. In the New Testament, the storm was real. The waves were real. The water in the ship was real. Their perception of what was going to happen was false. We're going to capsize and drown and die. Did that happen? No. Real, real circumstances, wrong perception that brought about fear with the disciples. Luke chapter 8. You don't have to turn there. You can stay camped out in our text. Uh, uh, verses 22 to 25. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, the Lord. And he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. That one kind of makes us all, I think, smile a little bit. There came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water. That was real. That was not an apparition. They weren't imagining things. And they were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose, rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. We see a connection with faith and fear. Fear and faith. Fear of the Lord increases our faith. Fear of the Lord increases our faith. Why do you say that? By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet. This is from the Hall of Faith, from Hebrews chapter 11. And it's verse 7 that talks about Noah. Being warned of God of things not as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So it's interesting here, the connection between faith and fear is that he moved with fear. He had a healthy fear of the Lord of what God was telling him to do. And he's a, here in the hall of faith. He's being lifted up by the Holy Spirit of God for the faith that he had that was coupled with his fear of the Lord. So fear of the Lord increases faith. Fear of man diminishes faith. The Lord said in Matthew chapter 10, verses 28 to 31, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. In Matthew 10, verse 28 to 31. So we're not to follow this minister, not to mimic the minister in his fear, because it was not a fear of the Lord that gave him faith. It was the fear of the enemy forces, fear of man, that diminished his faith. He was faithless. Well, what is faith? Believing God's word and acting upon it. So he had little faith. So he either didn't believe the promises of the word of God or the God that had been re revealed thus far. Or he simply didn't want to act upon it. In our spiritual warfare, the enemy's great host is real. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, plural, against powers, plural, against the rulers, plural, of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. The enemy's great host is real, 
But God's host is just as real and greater. This is up here where you have applause line. The applause thing goes up. Yeah, yeah. I know we're not that kind of church. But I believe in your hearts you're saying, amen, yeah. The enemy's host is real. It's big, it's strong, but God's host is just as real and greater. That's why we're to take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery doubts of the wicked. How many forces does Satan have? I know. It's not a numerical number. Let me rephrase the question. How many forces does Satan have compared to the number of forces that the Lord has? So just put aside for right now, God, Satan. Satan's powerful. God's more powerful. He's omnipotent. Who's stronger? God is. Okay, we understand that. But just put that aside and just look at their forces. An innumerable host of angels, which is why it's a trick question. You can't, can't give me a number. But comparing the two, who has the more numerical forces? And Brother Hunt was trying to give me an answer. God. Two-thirds to one-third. He's got twice as many thirds. <laughs> twice as many forces. If Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4 says, seems to teach us, one-third of the angels fell with Satan, then two-thirds of the innumerable company of angels stayed true to the captain of the host of the Lord. Amen. Yes, God's more powerful than Satan, but looking at their forces, God's forces trump Satan's forces two to one. Amen. Now, does God need numerical superiority? No, but he has it. That should <laughs> and if we're talking about spiritual warfare, spiritual battles, and those that are battling against us and those that are battling for us, I'll take the two to one advantage. Amen. Yeah. Satan is powerful, but the Lord is all-powerful. I heard, as it were, this is uh, John the Beloved on the Isle of Patmos, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6. He says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, and this is where you all break into the Alleluia chorus. You ready to lead us, Linnea, back there? At some point, maybe. Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent. And then you roll the R, reigneth. And then somewhere in here, maybe all the kids jump up and say, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Or not. It would be kind of neat if that just happened, but. So Satan's powerful, but God is all powerful. The Lord God, omnipotent, all powerful, reigneth. How do we know that he's more powerful than Satan? Well, when the Lord has ruled and reigned for a thousand years, when the thousand years are expired, reading in Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Who put him in prison? God. Who kept him in prison? God. Who's more powerful? God. He shall go out and deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And you can just silently in the pew there say, Amen. Satan's powerful, but the Lord is all-powerful. Elisha was used of the Lord to prophesy of God Almighty's victory 
over the Moabites and the Syrians. Fear not. Things aren't always as they seem, especially if you're not looking through spiritual spectacles. Don't be faithless, but full of faith to believe God's word and act upon it. I believe that's what we can learn from the minister that does, yes, in general service and servanthood and ministering, we can learn from that, but not learn from his fear and his faithlessness. Rather, let's play the prophet. Let's look at the man of God, Elisha. He was a perceptive prophet. He had on his spiritual spectacles. Where did he get those? Well, maybe from Elijah when he picked up the mantle. Maybe there were, there were some spectacles there that enabled him to see those uh, chariots and horses of, of, of fire. And so he'd already seen them once. He could still see them again. He answered, fear not, verse 16, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Because of the perception of the reality of the spiritual, we can trust that we have the strength of superior forces, even when the temporal sight picture shows otherwise. Jonathan and his armor barrier, too, went up against 20 in a particular, particular garrison of, of the Philistines. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over under the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Ten against one odds. And so the Lord doesn't need the numerical strength of forces uh, that he does have because he's all-powerful. He was, again, this uh, prophet, Elisha. He could see things that his servant couldn't. He was a perceptive prophet, and then he was a, a praying prophet. And I found it interesting in studying this out and meditating on it, uh, what Elisha prayed for and what he didn't pray for. And I would say, well, and on the one hand, all of his prayers were sight-related, were they not? We're going to look at three prayers that are in the text. And he didn't necessarily pray for all the circumstances to be changed. His three prayers were just praying that different people would see differently. How do we typically pray? Lord, make all the bad things go away. The bad people, the bad circumstances, the bad trials... The bad, bad, bad. Just make it all go away. And I find that that's not how necessarily Elisha prayed. He prayed, it is what it is, but let different people see differently the true reality of what's going on here. His first prayer, don't change the circumstances, change the perception. Open the eyes of this, my minister, my, my fellow laborer. I pray that he open his eyes that he may see, Lord, and the Lord open the eyes of the young man. And he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Then he prayed for the enemy. And he didn't necessarily pray, Lord, change the circumstances, just make them disappear. Uh, change their numerical strength. He just prayed, Lord, change the way in which they see. When they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. He didn't pray for changed circumstances with the enemy, just changed perception of the enemy. So our prayers can be for us and those we're laboring with and 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 fighting with in spiritual battles that we see differently and we can pray for the enemy that God would make them see differently. Then he prayed for the enemy again. And again, he was praying for their sight. This time, Lord, open their eyes. Uh, in uh, verse 20, it came to pass when they were come into Samaria 
that Elisha said, Lord, so this is a prayer, open the eyes of these men that they may see. Kind of a different sense of that hymn we were singing. Open their eyes that they may see. <laughs> Spirit divine, or however that goes. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. The enemy, the ones they were supposed to be attacking. Again, pray not for changed circumstances necessarily. Uh, pray for a, a change of perception. Uh, it's not related to spiritual warfare. Um, some of you know we have a new grandson, praise the Lord, and he's got some health issues with his lungs needing to, to kick into full gear. And, and uh, to be honest with you, I haven't necessarily been praying for uh, little Everett and Abby and, and Rich, uh, their, his parents. I haven't necessarily uh, been praying Lord, just instantly make Everett 100% healthy. I've been praying, Lord, you have the circumstances. They are what they are. Just change all of our perception of the circumstances. Um, I just, it's not, spiritual warfare doesn't fit in the message, but it does. Uh, because I find myself often praying wrong. Lord, change the circumstances. Well, he'll do what he'll do with the circumstances. Lord, change my perception of the circumstances. Those that I'm fighting with in this battle, change their perception of the circumstances. Lord, change the sight picture of the enemy that they will be stumped in their attacks. And then, when they're defeated, open their eyes and show them that they're defeated. Recently, I, I pretty much got to that point in learning these lessons in, in my life in spiritual warfare. And I said, all right, there's what I need to learn. Stop being, the, stop mimicking the minister. Ah, master, Lord, when we perish, we perish. Change me to fear not. Make me, make me see like Elisha, the, the prophet. Let me... Uh, let me, what am I supposed to do? Play the prophet. Lord, help me play the prophet and not mimic the minister. And in some, some spiritual battles that I've been fighting, I found myself going back and forth. And I read this passage and I meditated. And, it's like, and God said, there you go. Come on. Here's what you need to learn. Have the right perception. The circumstances might not necessarily change. Don't worry about that. Just view it spiritually. Okay, Lord, I got that. I initially stopped there, and then I continued to read, and the Lord said, whoa, 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 whoa. there's some more lessons to learn here, my child. And so I obediently said, okay, yes, Lord, what more uh, do I need to learn? And that's the point number, uh, point number three, uh, do I sometimes copy the king? And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, and when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And I find that sometimes that's what I shout out to God when it seems like the enemy might be at a disadvantage and in my grasp to crush, to destroy. Shall I smite him? Shall I smite him? And the Lord smote me, smote my heart with the prophet's response. And then the... Uh, I'm just seeing where I'm going here. Why would, uh, why would the king even have that thought? Uh, and, and what had the king see done uh, with the prophet that came before Elisha? Elijah. Do you remember when the northern king was having a beef with Elijah and sent a captain with how many soldiers? Fifty. And uh, goes out. And uh, this is back in chapter, chapter 1. And they go up to him and, are you Elijah? Are you the man of God? 
the king says to come on down off of that mountain. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. <laughs> and there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And they did it again. Uh, same thing happened a second time. Third time, the captain <laughs> was like... I don't want to knock that sign off. <laughs> He's like, oh, don't kill me. <laughs> he killed, uh, let's see, 51 times 2, 102 of us so far. Will you spare our lives? And Elijah's like, God, what do you want to do this time? God said, no, 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 you can go down. <laughs> no, we'll not kill them. In the New Testament, the, the followers of the Lord, specifically the sons of thunder, appropriately named James and John the sons of Zebedee they remembered Elijah they knew what God God could do it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up the Lord he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem and when his disciples James and John, that's where you say, bless their soul. Uh, James and John saw this. They said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not when, uh, what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Now, this is recorded in Luke chapter 9, uh, verses 51 to, to 56. Now, what a truth. What a truth I've needed to, to learn and reflect upon. The Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Oh, by the way, for some reason, Satan has seen fit to have those words removed from most perverted English Bibles of today. Uh, the ESV has that, that whole section removed uh, and said, you know not what, you know, the Lord's words rebuking them, you know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. If you have an ESV, those words are gone. <laughs> Leave them in my Bible, please. Um, just connecting with bibliology because I need those words I need those words so much so I put a sila after them in, in my notes stop the the preaching think about that son of man's not come to destroy men's lives but to save them this is the wisdom we hear in the Proverbs chapter 25 verse 21 and 22 if thine enemy be hungry Smite him! Smite him! No, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, mock him in his thirst. No, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. And, uh, we would have to understand the culture there. That's not burning, literally burning their head. That's, I have fire for warmth in my home and to cook my meal and you don't here let me take some coals and I guess culturally they put them in some sort of head carrying uh, uh, thing and so uh, we would understand that it's it's a good thing it's giving them their needs their their provisions how do we know that I'm not a cultural scholar well the New Testament explains it because Paul, in writing to the saints in Rome, references that proverb. And he tells us it's a good thing that it's being spoken of there. Recompense, uh, uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 17 to 21. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, Live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, 
avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And then he starts to quote the proverb. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So even if we don't fully understand the cultural reference there, Paul tells us, the Holy Spirit tells us, that's a good, good thing. Uh, can I have you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2? I know you're, you're anchored there in, in our text back in, in 2 Kings, but uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I'd like you to follow along as I read a, a passage as we start to draw some things to a, a close here. Closing out this third point and you know, wrapping things up, I want to leave some time for uh, testimonies that we mentioned we're, we'll have here after the, the message. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, will you follow along as I read, uh, beginning in verse 5, uh, down to verse 11. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So that contrarywise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I found myself saying this statement a few times recently. The greatest persecutor of the Lord's churches in the first century upon his salvation became the greatest first century evangelist. And who are we to say that God cannot save a church persecutor in the 21st century? Think back to King Jehoram. What would have happened if he would have smote the enemy? He certainly was anxious. He didn't even get a response before he repeated it. Should we smite him? Should we smite him? What if Elisha wouldn't have been quick enough to say, hey, no. Likely it would have been a vengeful one-upmanship. What if the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, had heard what had happened and oh, he just killed them all? Well, send more forces and then back and forth. And eventually they did come and besiege Samaria and it was because of the wickedness of the northern uh, kingdom. But just in normal battles, it doesn't always uh, do us well to bring our own vengeance and then just have it back on us and back and forth. I'm not to look at souls being used by the enemy and say, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? Rather, I'm to prepare provision for them. It's hard for me to even say this, but I believe it's what the the scriptures is teaching us I know this I'm not to pray for the destruction of their lives I'm to pray for the salvation of their souls biblical truths that we can see by wearing our spiritual glasses biblical truths in spiritual warfare take us from alas my master to fear not and biblical truths in spiritual warfare take us from smite them to save them. When you feel overwhelmed by a great host of the enemy, pray. Uh, but don't necessarily pray that God will change all the circumstances of your situation. Uh, do pray, biblically I believe, from our example in the text tonight, pray that God would change the perception 
of those circumstances. That you, you and your spouse, you and your family, you and your friends, your co-laborers in the Lord would look through these spiritual lenses of the principles of God's word to see God's almighty power and his host, his host, arrayed for action. Pray that the enemy would be blinded in a manner as to prohibit them from inflicting harm. Pray that the enemy would have their eyes opened to their ultimate defeat if they keep fighting against the Lord. And not talking about fallen angels and and demons, but those souls, humans, souls that Satan is trying to use as the enemy, pray for their salvation. Our, our theme this year is not destroy one in 21. It's win one in 21, is it not? And that sounds kind of silly, but I've had to be reminded of that by the Lord through his, his wonderful word. So again, my prayer in, in spiritual warfare is that uh, there would be something, just one thing, maybe more, hopefully more, but at least one thing everyone would be able to take home in the spiritual battles we face from from hearing from the Lord tonight.